Ja. All right. Shall we get started? So, uh, welcome back. I guess this is uh, lecture number one, two, three, four, five, five. <laughs> two more after today. Uh, so let's just dive in right, right where we were in the morning, uh, talking about these um, operator product expansions. In, in particular, this, this curious looking gadget, C delta of X partial, that would implement for us uh, the sum over descendant states. We're gonna, you know, we have some operator product expansion, we have a sum, uh, we, we bring two operators close together and we express that as a sum of local operators and in particular, we can restrict just to primaries, primary operators, if we have this gadget which implements for us the automatically a sum over descendants. And I was claiming we have very good control over this, that this guy is basically completely determined up to a number, and that number is basically the three-point function, corresponding three-point function coefficient, where I take these two operators and I take um, the primary. Uh, that I'm focusing on in that sum. Basically by the diagonal, this diagonal property of the two-point functions in conformal field theory. Okay, so let's take that as our part of point of departure and let's try to get some payoff from it, from all this technical development. And the payoff is pretty big, which is why I've gone through this, this, this long song and dance. Let's introduce the notion of conformal blocks. Are there any questions about that? That notion, the, 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 the way these, this, this relation between this three-point function, two-point function, the sum over descendants. It's all clear, that's good. Okay, so there are implications here of, of this OPE for four and also higher point functions. So we saw earlier that if I take, and, and let's just take four identical scalars. I mean, we can do more complicated representations of the Lorentz group if we have to, but let's keep it simple because we're just trying to emphasize concepts here rather than technical virtuosity. So three identical scalar operators. And we discussed earlier how there are these two cross ratios, U and V, uh, that I can form when I have four points. And that in general, this correlation function, it's not fixed by conformal symmetry anymore. It depends on a function of those two cross ratios. And then there's some kinematic bit which has to be consistent with the special conformal uh, symmetry and scaling. So let's write it in the following way. There are all sorts of different ways of writing this denominator. Um, Basically, it will alter the function up here in the numerator by some, you know, basically monomial in U and V. And I, I'm taking eta here to be the, the scaling dimension of the, these four identical operators, just so that I have another Greek letter to work with that's not delta. So we saw in the morning that we can decompose each of these pairs into an operator product expansion, into a sum over local operators. So let's do that. So we have phi of x1, phi of x2. This is going to be a sum over primary operators. I can't restrict to scalars anymore. There could well be uh, operators in here which have spin. I can't control that. C delta I, again, we really only emphasize this in the morning for scalar, uh, scalar operators, but in, in, in principle, we have it for everything. X12 partial Y by delta I Y, and then at the end, I'll set Y equal to X2. 
just so I have some sanity in how these derivatives act. I don't get confused about whether this is supposed to act somehow on x12 also. phi of x3, phi of x4, I can write the same thing just with some label changes. Maybe we have a z here. z equals x4. Okay, and now as a next step, we'll take this, I'll plug that in, and for the four-point function, let me just write it schematically as phi, 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 phi. Uh, what am I going to see? So when I put these two, two in, right, so I have in principle a double sum, but because again, of the diagonal nature of these two-point functions, it collapses to a single sum. I'm only going to get contributions to the sum when these labels are the same, when I have the same primary term in each sum. So I get a single sum, delta i, c delta i squared, and then two of these gadgets. I need a better name for it than gadget. I've run out of room. So those are going to be acting on a two-point function on the next line. So phi delta i of y, phi delta i of z. And then this whole thing evaluated at y equals x2, z equals x4. And that thing in brackets, that thing in brackets, that's the conformal block. That's the conformal block. So I, I, I'm able to write this four-point function as just a, a sum in the following way. I write it as sum over the primaries, these three-point function coefficients, g delta i uv, let's pull out that same kinematic factor so I can express it all in terms of a cross ratio. So this numerator is what I'll, what I'll call the conformal block. That's what I'll more precisely call the conformal block with that kin kinematic factor pulled out. So this is really, this is really a triple exclamation mark moment. And why am I saying that? It's because the data of the four-point function is contained in what? In the three-point function coefficients, these C delta i's, and also the spectrum. of the CFT. So if you give me that data, everything else fixed by conformal symmetry, I plug it into my formula, I can give you the four-point function. Okay. Yeah. Just by comparison with this over here. I, I, I know, I mean, the only thing else that's sitting there is a constant. So I, I know I ought to be able to pull this out. I mean, I can pull it out in different ways. There, there are other things I could put downstairs, but it will just shift with exactly what I mean by the G. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so, and I can write this one more time. I'm just writing the same thing again and again, but it, it's all, they're all kind of useful, slightly different ways of saying the same thing. I can write this numerator in terms of the two-point function. I can just pull those kinematic factors out 
and, and decompose that function of cross ratios, which tells me what the four point function is, into a sum over these conformal blocks. And this is all completely fixed. The stuff that's not fixed, right, again, I can't emphasize this too much, is what I'm summing over and what these numbers are. That's up, up to the definition of the theory. And it's really, it's really very striking. And it's actually not true just for four-point functions. It's true for higher-point functions as well. And I, I won't do it in detail, but let me draw a picture or two to convince you how it might go. So for example, so let me just write it down. It's a similar story. True for and greater than four-point functions. So let's, let's look at a five-point function. And here's a sort of similar way of, of looking at like what we're doing. So what I, I'm doing over here, I, 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 the, the picture you should probably have in mind is something like this, where I, I bring one and two together, I bring three and four together, and I sum over the intermediate primaries. Here I could bring one and two together, sum over some intermediate primaries, and bring this internal line and this guy together. And there's going to be a whole bunch of these that I've got to sum over, so maybe I have to do this a bunch of times. And then finally, I bring four and five together. So I can imagine decomposing higher point functions in a similar way by bringing external lines and mixtures of external and internal lines close together, implementing this sum over these, uh, through, through, through combining these, these, these C delta i's, getting these conformal blocks. But at the end of the day, all of these higher point functions are, again, they're, they're defined by the spectrum and the choice of three point functions. So what, what, I'm, what I'm saying here, right, I'm saying that the CFT is defined, all the correlations are defined this way, three point functions, two point functions we already dealt with, they're fixed by conformal symmetry, and now all the higher point functions are gonna be defined by the choice of spectrum and these C delta I, these three point function coefficients. So you give me that, I can give you anything you want. That's the claim. Yeah. Can you explain how uh, the, say the operator three interacts with the conformal block in this five point function? Yeah, I mean, we should really sit down and, 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 and write down some equations, but I, which I don't want to do, but, but morally I hope it's clear that you, you have, yeah, I mean, you, you have another leg here and so, so for each time you insert one of these operators, you could imagine bringing each term in this sum, each term in the sum is like a leg, bringing that close to the third operator, which is fixed. And that decomposes in turn into some, some additional OPE sum. I mean, really, I one should sit right. down and do it more carefully, but I hope at the level of pictures, it's clear. So it'll be like a sum over conformal blocks? You have two sums over conformal blocks now, one for each internal line. It's a double sum, yeah. I see. Thank you. Okay, so how about an example? Let's see. What do these conformal blocks look like? I said they're completely fixed. Uh, in many cases, they're known. In some cases, they're still to be kind of worked out. They're known sort of partially. Um, so a lot of this is still, I guess, maybe work in progress. I mean, depending on how complicated you want to, how complicated a four-point function you want to consider. Like, I don't know, you have your favorite 10 index tensor operator, and you want to know its four-point function. Uh, in that case, you've got a lot of work to do to, to work out these conformal blocks. But in simple cases, so for example, if you want four identical 
scalars like we've been considering so far. Um, and uh, if uh, uh, for I, let's label it by L. So I'll just consider um, these, these are going to be symmetric traceless reps of, uh, of, of Lorentz, so of S of D in this case. And that turns out to be all that you need to sum over in this case of four identical scalars. I won't, I won't show that to you, but let me just assert that it's true. So in that case, the conformal blocks take the following, well, frankly, rather complicated form. So I've got Z, Z bar. I'll, I'll tell you what Z and Z bar in a minute. They're related to the other cross ratios I defined. K delta plus L of Z, K delta minus L minus two of Z minus this whole expression with Z and Z bar swapped. And what is that function? K beta of Z is uh, Z to the beta over two and a hypergeometric. Okay, and then finally, uh, what is Z and Z bar? So U is uh, Z times Z bar, and V is one minus Z, one minus Z bar. So let, let me try and give you a little bit more intuition for what those Z and Z bar coordinates are. I have a feeling the experts in 2D CFT have seen them before. So I was talking a little bit last time about how you can use the conformal group to fix some of your insertion locations. So let's look at the plane. Actually, I'm in, I'm in R4 here. So this is, oh, sorry, this is, this is 4D. This is only gonna work in four dimensions. That's an important part, point, I believe. Anyway, so I'm in four dimensions to even write this down. So each of these has four coordinates. So I'm free to shift one of my points to the origin. I can put another point uh, at one, and I can send my fourth point off to infinity uh, using the conformal group, and I can rotate everything so I'm in some fixed plane now, and I have x2 is sitting up here in, my, in some complex complexified plane. So x2, having done this, in complex coordinates, the location of x2 is z and z bar. So that's another way of thinking about this particular set of cross ratios. Okay, so that's an example of a conformal block, and that's how you would, you know, start uh, a bootstrap program uh, for fixing four-point functions of identical scalars in 4D, which, which we'll get to. Well, that's sort of where we're going with all this. So you're probably wondering, how would I go about deriving that? Well, I mean, the hard way is we have explicit or semi-explicit representations of these, these gadgets. So we can act with two of them on a two-point function, do that sum over descendants and see what we get. Uh, but in fact, often there's, a, there's an easier way. But before I go on, I, I should pause, I think, for questions. Is this all clear? Yeah. Um, I think, I should be careful of what I say, but I think they're going to be fixed more by what, what's on the external leg. So it, it, the thing that's going to be new in the six-point function is that you're going to have internal legs with spin. So you're going to have to worry about the conformal blocks for, say, three scalars and one object that has internal spin. So that, that would make it different. But uh, it's different in that specific way. It's not different from sort of general first principles. So I've got to start all start all over again. <laughs> that makes. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. There's an implicit dependence that I 
in my head that I, I have these four identical scalars that I haven't written down. Yeah. And if I need to know this, so that there's an implicit dependence on the fact that I have these four external legs, whatever they are. In this case, they're just four identical scalars. But yeah, I need to know it not just for um, scalar operators on the internal legs, but for all spins. Although I claim in this particular case, I can just worry about symmetric traceless representations of Lorentz. I haven't explained why, oh, okay. but it, that's how it, how it goes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought everyone knows this notation. Obviously not. So this is a 2F1. It's a hypergeometric function. And the subscripts have to do with how many Pock M are... So, so there are series representations of these objects. And the, POC, and, and the subscripts have to do with how many Pock M are symbols you have in the numerator versus in the denominator. You've seen them? Yeah, okay. Maybe you don't want to see them. Oh, let, me, let me just, uh, I, I, okay, let, let, I, think, I think that, I'll probably get it wrong, but the, the definition is something like this. So I'm gonna have, so, so I have these three, in, three things, alpha, beta, gamma, z, and I believe it looks like this. So I have a sum on j equals zero to infinity, one over j factorial, Pockhammer alpha j, Pockhammer beta j, Pock hammer gamma j, and then the whole thing times z to the j. That's the series representation of this 2-1 hypergeometric, and you can kind of guess how it might generalize if I had like a PQ now, but, okay, good. Yeah. They're not theory dependent. No, it, this is just dependent on you know what I have on the external legs, what I have uh, go, what what pri yeah, what primary I have in mind that's joining them up. So, for, for example, if I have a CFT which has uh, other global symmetries, uh, uh, why is the formal box uh, not feel that you have? Oh, do not feel that I have. So, so sometimes what happens if you have more symmetry, like you have supersymmetry, you're, you're able to group things into larger multiplets. So you would not have just a primary of the conformal algebra, you could have a superprimary or a chiral primary, something that was, say, annihilated not by K, but by the superconformal generator S. And now you can talk about conformal blocks which sum not just over the descendants of the conformal group, but the descendants of the whole superconformal group. So you'd have much larger blocks at your disposal and it might be more constraining. You might have, might give you a little bit more power in writing down these four point functions. And those of you uh, in, the, in, the, in the 2D community, um, you've got these huge multiplets that are based on the Virasor algebra where you, you don't have primaries that you just generate with momentum You've got, sorry, descendants that you just generate by acting with momentum. You've got descendants that you act, you get by acting with the whole Virasoro algebra. So you've got these huge Virasoro multiplets that generate their huge conformal blocks and you could use those instead in this, this kind of picture. So that's how the, the larger symmetry might come in by, by, by changing what you mean by a multiplet. But yeah, if you have conformal symmetry, you're always free to break things back down into these basic conformal mul multiplets. Thanks, good question. Anything else? All right, so I wanted to show you how you might go about deriving these. And I, I have, I guess, basically two different derivations up my sleeve that I'll, I'll try and share with you. One is a slightly more modern take that uses uh, a differential equation, and one is a brute force where we're just gonna use this definition to construct it. But let's do the slightly more modern take first. It's a bit more elegant. So deriving
conformal blocks. I'll try and take a very high level uh, uh, take on this. So that the idea is to find a differential equation for which g delta i uv is a solution. Very easy, right? Well, actually, it's not so bad. So, so we claim that this guy, this g delta i uv, is an eigenvector or function of the Casimir of the conformal group. Okay, so what do I mean by that? You're probably familiar with the Casimir for SO3. That's just J squared which you saw in quantum mechanics was jx squared plus jy squared plus jz squared, or I can write it in our slightly more uh, generalized notation as say m yz squared plus m xz squared plus m xy squared, where these are the generators of the Lorentz algebra. They're the same as the j's in quantum mechanics. And indeed, in general, for SOD, I can write my Casimir, I'll just write lowercase letter CAS as some sum one half because I'm gonna have, I'm gonna duplicate these indices if I write it this way, but it's the same as the line above. In general, the Casimir for SOD is just this quadratic sum on M's. So what is this gadget? Why is it important? It's important because it commutes with all the elements, all the generators of the, of the Lorentz group. Which I won't verify for you, but I'll let you check that if I go ahead and I commute mu nu with Casimir, it equals zero. And so I can diagonalize uh, everything in the same irrep of the, of the rotation group and have it have, it have the same eigenvalue. So, so everything in the same irreducible representation of SOD will have the same eigenvalue, which I claim you're already familiar with from quantum mechanics, right? This is how we dealt with SO3 rotations in quantum mechanics. It had this nice eigenvalue. J squared was L times L plus one. And then you could find out further eigenvalues with respect to JZ and so forth. Anyway, I claimed before that the conformal group is essentially a rotation group, but in a funny signature. That's SOD plus one comma one. And the way that goes together, if some of you already did my exercise, well, here's the answer. I can use M minus one zero if I let my indices run all the way from minus one to D, uh, D I guess D. I'll let that be dilatation. I'll let M zero I be the following linear combination of momentum and special conformal. And I'll let M minus one I be the other independent combination. And M, the MIJs are the usual ones. And my metric the thing that's gonna implement this indefinite signature, well, I've written it kind of in the wrong way, um, but I want the minus one, minus one element to be minus one and everything else, zero, zero, and I, I to be one. 
And that's how I'm going to contract these indices, right? I'll raise and lower indices of the, of the generators with that, with that particular uh, indefinite signature metric. So there's some more work here to do to compute what this is in terms of our, our familiar generators. A little bit more of an exercise. So for us, our, our Casimir, I claimed it was one half mu nu mu nu, so we write this out, we've got one half, you know, the piece of it that's just sort of standard rotation group stuff, and then the stuff that comes from our extra generators. So I've got d squared, I claim, I've got one half uh, pi ki, and I've got one half ki pi, and maybe I want to change things so my special conformal is all always on the right, so I can always use it to annihilate a primary state, so I'll use my commutation relations uh, for the conformal group. And I'm gonna get d times d minus square root of minus one times the dimension minus pi ki. Great. And, you know, we were interested in these symmetric traceless representations. I wanted to show you how to derive this particular example of the, of the, of the conformal block. So let's, let's focus on those, these symmetric traceless reps of, uh, of SD, so D subgroup inside the conformal group. And so when I act with my Casimir on a primary state, what am I gonna get? Well, the first part, again, it should be familiar to you from quantum mechanics. So here's that L times L plus one bit, but now it's shifted because I'm in D dimensions. So D equals three, that's the SO3 kind, you'd get L times L plus one. And then the rest, well, I know D acting on this guy gives me I times delta. So I've got to be a little bit careful about my factors of i, but a moment's thought should convince you that this is delta times delta minus d, this whole thing acting again on my primary state. And I claim since this is the Casimir, it doesn't matter if I act on the primary or any of its descendants, I'll always get this eigenvalue. I'll always get this eigenvalue because of that commutation property, because this is a Casimir. Okay, let's go back to the four-point function after that interlude on Casimirs of the conformal group. So I've got my phi of x1, phi of x2, phi of x3, phi of x4, and I'm gonna insert a resolution of the identity phi of x1, phi of x2, psi, and I've got to multiply that by the corresponding psi, phi of x3, phi of x4. Great. Now, it could, these could be, for example, eigenstates of the dilatation operator. And just like we did before when we were talking about these operator product expansion, let's organize this into sums over primaries and their descendants. And in particular, let's restrict to phi delta i and descendants. And I claim that should compute the conformal block corresponding to this guy up to some three-point function coefficients. So here's the prime indicating that restriction. Sum on these states, phi x1, phi x2, psi, 
guess I'm just writing it again with this restricted sum, but it, it's an important conceptual difference here. It's, it's a restricted sum, I'm just looking at one multiplet of a conformal group now when I make this restriction. And, and this should be what? This should be G delta I of U V um, X one, two, two eta, X three, four, two eta, and maybe, you know, I should put in some C delta I squared uh, three point function coefficient, but basically that's just a, you know, a linear, uh, a linear correspondence. When I solve some differential equation, I could always adjust this to have some conventional normalization. We're almost there. Hope people see where we're going with this. So I, I'll take a look at one of these, 5x1, 5x2, Casimir psi. I'll just in, go ahead and insert the Casimir operator to see what we get. And since I know in this restriction that everything will have the same eigenvalue, I can write this as that eigenvalue I had over there, L, L plus D minus two plus delta, delta minus D all times that three-point function, psi of x1, psi of x2, ugh. right? It's by, by construction. We can go ahead and we can call this That eigenvalue, let's call it lambda delta L. But there's an adjoint action too. I could imagine acting with this Casimir to the left. We should get the same thing. And so just by staring at this equation, I hope you can convince yourself that if I think about the Casimir acting on G delta L of U and V, this should be lambda delta L, G delta L, of u and v. And I'm being a little bit sloppy about the kinematic factors that are going to be important in the end, um, but I, I hope you see sort of the general picture here, that the differential equation that I wanted to find for whom the, ca the, the conformal blocks would be the solution, it's the Casimir operator. It's the Casimir operator for the conformal group. So if you can solve this second order ODE, not ODE, PDE, you can find the conformal, conformal blocks. Questions? Doesn't look so bad, right? The solution's just some hypergeometrics. The fact that it's a PDE I find a little bit scary, but uh, you know, maybe you know, sufficiently motivated um, can find, find these solutions without too much trouble. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So in a general CFT, is it a problem of finding these conformal blocks, or is usually analyzing a CFT, so the hard part of analyzing a CFT, something different? I, it, it was sort of a cottage industry for a while, finding these conformal blocks. I think it was rather hard at the beginning. It took, I think it took a little bit of time for people to kind of develop these techniques. I mean, I think the initial approach, they'd use these, uh, these C delta partial gadgets, Uh, you know, acting with those on two-point functions to try and construct them, or maybe, you know, develop some integral representation of this. Uh, but, you know, as time has gone on, I think we've kind of gotten better and better at it. And these days, if, if you can basically just look up the right paper and find it. Uh, you don't even have to do it yourself. Um, unless, you know, you want to do it for some 10-index tensor operator for some reason, which no one has done before. In which case, you may have a lot of work in front of you. Um, but you know, for these simple kinds of things, it's usually not so bad. The hard, the hard part comes maybe a bit later uh, in actually trying to pin down a realistic spectrum or realistic set of three-point coefficients for the CFT. 
All right, thank you. Uh, I was saying that if I'm interested in these uh, four-point function for symmetric, sorry, four-point function for four identical scalar operators, the only thing that shows up in this intermediate channel are symmetric traceless uh, primaries and their descendants. I didn't explain why, um, but that was the claim. And so because of that, I only need to work out those conformal blocks. There's many of them. They're indexed by numbers, so there's scalar, that's symmetric. Well, I guess it's morally traceless. I don't know. The, the stress tensor is in a symmetric traceless. The vector is in a symmetric traceless. Ah, but you're allowing uh, several indices. You can have many indices, ah. as long as they're all symmetric, and if I contract any two of them, okay. it vanishes. Okay. So I claim those in general form irreps of uh, Lorentz, or rotation. Okay, so I, I promised another way of getting at these conformal blocks, but that's gonna have to wait, because uh, I, I really don't want to generate conformal blocks for the full CFT, which have these two cross ratios. It's a bit too messy for me. So I'm gonna give my next demonstration of a conformal block derivation for the boundary theory, where it's a whole lot simpler. So let's return to the main topic of these lectures, adding a boundary or defect in, the, in these, this kind of context. And there's a new there's a new thing that shows up now when I have a boundary or defect that there's two distinct kinds of operator product expansion or operator product decomposition. There's the kind that we had before where you take two operators in the bulk and you bring them close together and you can write them, in this case, I'm just thinking of scalar operators, and you write them over, as a sum over some three-point function coefficients. And these C delta I operators, C delta I gadgets, partial two phi I of X2, where the risk of confusing uh, how these derivatives act, I'll just label these already as, as uh, derivatives with respect to the, the second coordinate. So in, to do this, I've made a couple of non-trivial assumptions, which maybe I should point out. Maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> I worry these assumptions are a little bit too strong in, in general, frankly, that um, you may actually have trouble satisfying them in, in, in generic situations. So, so the assumptions here is that phi of x, this bulk field, is a primary with respect to the full conformal symmetry group, the SOD plus one comma one. And that's a little bit strong, right? Because I've broken that. I've broken that explicitly by putting in this defector boundary. And so I'm, I'm somehow hoping that even though it's broken globally, there's still some local notion of a current algebra away from the defector boundary where I can still think about these objects in the bulk as being primaries with respect to the full group. And I have to say, I'm, I worry about that assumption. So, where am I with 
with this. Okay, so, right, so there's something already kind of interesting you can do with this in the boundary case that you couldn't do in the case without a defect or boundary. We can take an expectation value of that expression. Phi of x1, phi of x2, and I, I told you last time that you know, two-point functions in the case of a boundary or defect, they're non-trivial. They're like four-point functions in general, and they depend on functions of cross ratio. So these are, these are non-trivial objects. They're like the four-point functions we had before. If I go ahead and I take this, this expectation value, I can write this as a sum over, I don't know why I put a hat on there. Shouldn't be a hat. C delta I, C delta I, x1, 2, partial 2, phi i, x2. Right, because you know, unlike the usual case, once I introduce a defect or boundary, these guys can have non-zero one-point functions. Right? In the boundary case, I could, you know, restrict to the case where uh, it's just the sum over scalar operators, but regardless, without the defect, phi i of x2 would just be zero, except with one very important exception, except for the identity operator. You want to leave room for these this, to still have a non-zero two-point function in a, in a CFT. So there there's, could be one term here that would still survive, would be the one point, the identity operator in that sum. So let's, let's focus on the boundary case to make our lives simpler, where only the scalars get one-point functions, and I can write their one-point function in a simple way as some number, a delta over the distance to the boundary, raised to the appropriate power, so everything has the right dimensions. And if I do that, If I do that, my, my two-point function, phi of x1, phi of x2, uh, I can write it as a sum on delta. This bulk, I guess, defect, two-point function coefficient, x1, 2, partial 2, a delta over r2 to the delta. Or, more suggestively, let's pull the one-point function coefficient out and think about this acting just on the one-point function. We'll write that as a bulk conformal block. So, four-point functions without defect or like two-point functions with, and so maybe it's not so surprising that in this case I can write my two-point function as a sum over conformal blocks, where in this case the data of the CFT is contained in, in these two coefficients. This would be like a bulk defect coefficient, the coefficient of the bulk defect operator, and that would be the, the one-point function. Coefficient. And I'll, I'll point out something that's rather peculiar about the boundary case compared to the case we had before. You know, before, right, there was, a, there was something squared sitting here. There was C delta squared. And then now I, I don't have that. And so there, there's going to be concerns later when we, we move to the bootstrap about positivity of these coefficients. So it's, it turns out to be much harder to run a bootstrap program for boundary CFT because because what's sitting here is not a perfect square. But we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that. So I claim we can guess, I'm, I'm not gonna derive it, we can guess this bulk conformal block from what I wrote before 
and our intuition about mirror charges. We're going to guess G delta bulk from the four-point function case. And the intuition goes a little bit like this. We have our boundary. We have our two insertion points, x1, x2. And we're also going to have some mirror image points. Maybe we'll call this x3 and x4 on the other side of the boundary. And in this particular configuration, uh, those z and z bar cross ratios we use to write the conformal blocks in the bulk case, they wind up being c1. So the short calculation to see that. And then so perhaps it's not so surprising then that this bulk conformal block looks like one of those hypergeometrics that we had before. Minus delta. I guess I mean minus eta plus delta over 2, 2 F1, delta over 2, delta over 2, 1 minus D over 2 plus delta minus C1. It's this, basically the same hypergeometric that showed up before. You have to adjust the prefactors a little bit uh, because of the way the definitions have shifted, but um, at least from some moral sense, it's perhaps not so surprising that this shows up. I'm not going to derive it. You can use this Casimir technique uh, that I showed before to do it, um, or you can use a direct technique trying to sum, sum these C deltas. In this case, you just have one C delta acting, so perhaps it's not so hard to just work this out uh, by hand. Questions about that? So that's the bulk. OPE, but there's another OPE that I want to get to next. It's all clear. Okay. It's the second type. Of OPE. We'll call it the defect. Or boundary OPE depending on what particular circumstance we're interested in. And the idea here is that you can think of the boundary or defect as being its own operator. It's not it, it's an extended operator. Uh, and you can ask, what happens when I bring some local operator close to that defector boundary? And the claim is, that when I do that, I can express the bulk operator as a sum over boundary operators. So I put the hat on these operators to indicate they're on the boundary. Um, there's again some coefficients here. And uh, oh, and the other thing I wanted to say is that, that this index, you might think this is an SOD index, but it's not. This is now some sort of generalized SOP cross SOQ index. Because the operators that are on the boundary, they, they have this boundary explicitly breaks the rotational symmetry. And so there are really two different kinds of representations I have to worry about. There's a transverse rotation group, and there's a tangential one. And the operators on the boundary are labeled by both in general. Great. So this provides another way of decomposing two-point functions in the boundary case. Sorry, 
This is some bulk operator, bulk scalar. And these are all boundary or defect operators. And the point X has a, some boundary displacement and some displacement also into the bulk. That's right, you're assuming that this R is small, that you're bringing this guy close to the boundary. So it's a, it, if you think about the defect as its own operator, it's an operator product expansion that you get by bringing the bulk operator close to this extended <laughs> operator, which is the defect. It's valid as an operator expression the same way it was in the bulk, assuming we don't get any other operators sort of in this radius of convergence, you know, closer to the boundary than this R. I think you should, I guess the intuition is again sort of a Taylor series, right? Like if you have a function at a general point, you can express it as an expansion around the origin. So the origin here would be the defect. So you have, you keep evaluating the function and derivatives of it higher and higher order at the origin on the defect and that will tell you information away from the defect. That's my intuition for it. This one I'm actually less worried about than the bulk one. This one doesn't require as many assumptions. I mean, the, the things I'm expanding around, I know the theory has this symmetry. It has this SOP cross SOQ symmetry. Whereas the previous case, even though it was more similar to what you saw before, there really is a leap of faith that I have this notion of this local current algebra that these bulk operators really are still primary with respect to the full conformal group. This is an assumption that bothers me a bit. Right, so I want to use this to get another way, and this is our first example of crossing symmetry, um, another way of getting at that two-point function, that bulk two-point function. So I'm going to insert both of these, uh, these, uh, these C guys in, and I'm going to sum over boundary operators. So I've got my bulk defect two-point function. I think I said something wrong before. This is not a bulk defect coefficient. This is really a three-point function coefficient still. It's really a three-point function coefficient. I'm summing over bulk operators. So C delta hat I, R partial Y, C delta hat I, R2 partial Z, acting on a boundary two-point function. I keep running out of room. And this is at Y equals X1 and Z equals X2. So, I mean, the sort of schematic picture you have in mind here is you have your phi of x1, your phi of x2, here's my boundary, and I'm summing over some operators here on the boundary. It's like that four-point function I had before that I've chopped in half. Whereas the picture above, 
the thing you should have in mind is something more like this, where I bring these two operators close together. I express it as some sum over bulk operators, delta and i. And here's my boundary. And in fact, in the boundary case, I can remove the index because I know it's just a sum over scalars. Okay, so given that decomposition, I can write it in a shorthand version as delta hat i c delta hat i squared. Now that's squared again, that's good. That will be positive, that's a useful, useful thing to see. g delta hat i c1 c2, if I'm in the defect case and I've got these full two cross ratios, r1 to the delta 1 r2 to the delta 2. Okay, so there's another kind of conformal block, this defect conformal block um, that, uh, that I, can, I can go after. And, you know, while um, I can think of these guys as eigenfunctions of the bulk, Casimir, the full SOD plus one comma one, these guys will be eigenfunctions of some SO P plus one comma one cross SOQ Casimir. So that would be a way of getting at, uh, getting at these, 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 uh, these conformal blocks in the defect and boundary case, which is how I think they were first worked out, in fact but I'd like to be a little bit perverse uh, because I can be. Uh, in this case, the calculation's not too bad and show you just by like straight brute force computation how to get at this guy uh, directly from these guys. So that I think is probably gonna take most of the rest of my time today, but hopefully I'll have a little bit more time at the end. No, I, well, probably take about 20, 20 minutes or so. But before I get started on that, are there, are there questions? So we, we have to gear up here. This is, a, this is a detailed, intense calculation at the end of the day. Um, so I hope you'll bear with me for 15 or 20 minutes while I do this. I think it's worthwhile. Oh, uh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. So in the first type of OP, you said uh, that you have this non-trivial assumption about the primaries being primaries of the full conformal group? Right. Um, wouldn't that be true only if the conformal group is locally true, which is true in two dimensions, but I'm not sure if it's true in higher dimensions. If it's locally, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm, I'm trying to say, that I, I, I'm assuming there's some local, uh, local version of the current algebra, which is letting me talk about conformal primaries with, the, with respect to the con full conformal group as long as I'm far from the defect or boundary. And I, I'm not sure that's in general true. Like I, I know there's this whole story about the extraordinary phase transition in, in condensed matter physics where you might think that's an example of a boundary conformal field theory, but actually their power law, um, there's some power law background. Uh, there's some sort of surface ordering and I often wonder that because of that power law, you've probably, you know, you've locally now broken the full conformal group, and it may be rather difficult then to talk about um, uh, these as being primaries with respect to the full conformal group, because now the defect has made its presence known far away, in a power law way, but still it's made its, made its presence known. Technical aside for those who, who worry about these things. The defect case, though, I think this, this decomposition is, is a little bit more reliable. I mean, it's true, for example, it, it, this kind of thing shows up in the ADS-CFT correspondence, believe it or not. This is, uh, this is the bulk-to-bulk uh, -bulk propagator, I think, in, uh, in ADS-CFT. Anyway. Everyone ready for a hard computation to finish off the lecture.
All right. Well, first I need to tell you what this capital C derivative operator is. Okay? And I'll use the same or version of what I was telling you before. We're gonna, before I was saying compare a three-point function to a two-point function. Well, in this defect case, what I want to do is I want to compare a bulk defect function, because that's like a three-point function. So it has this form we determined a couple of lectures ago. So I've got a bulk operator with dimension delta and a boundary operator with dimension delta hat. This is phi of x, phi hat at zero. And this had better be, so I'll pull out that bulk defect constant in front so that I have some con conventionally normalized capital C derivative operator acting on now a defect, defect two-point function. There's too many hats floating around. Okay, this is just like we did in the bulk, but now this is the, 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 the defect realization of it. So let's focus on this. To start with, we're gonna rewrite it in a funny way in some sort of Taylor series expansion. So we've got R to the delta minus delta hat, X to the two delta hat, and one plus R squared over X squared delta hat. And now the fun begins. So I'll expand that out. As a geometric series or maybe a derivative of a geometric series. So there's a little bit of work to see how this goes, but I claim I can write it in terms of my friend, the Pockhammer symbol, J factorial minus r squared over x squared to the j. Okay? Uh, sorry, what's the Good. I hope I get this right. So if I take a j, this is a times a plus one times a plus two all the way up to a plus j minus one. Okay, so next step, I need the following useful fact about the d minus one dimensional Laplacian. And I'm actually gonna use this, I think, tomorrow or the next day in a totally orthogonal situation. So this, keep this formula in mind. So the way I derive it is I usually plug a few examples on Mathematica and figure out the general pattern. You can also do it by hand. It's not, I guess, I guess by hand, it's really pretty straightforward too. So the claim is this is beta times beta plus three minus D over X to the beta plus two. Well, there's two derivatives acting, so that denominator better increase by two, and then you've got to work a little bit uh, to get the numerator. That's not quite all I want. I want J of these acting on one over x to the two delta, because remember, I, this, this c operator, it's, it's derivative, so I somehow want to re-express this in terms of derivatives, and I'm gonna use this fact to do that. So the claim is this is two to the two j, delta Pockhammer symbol, delta plus three minus d over two, Pockhammer symbol, and then that whole thing over x to the two delta hat plus two j. So you can side it, kind of see how it's gonna go. They just in, inductively from this first step, each of these will generate its own Pockhammer symbol, and I'm pulling out some factors of two so I can just write um, 
So the steps, I mean, the steps otherwise would go up by two. So by pulling out these factors of two, I can arrange for the steps to go up by one. So I can rewrite it in terms of Pock hammers. Right. Okay. So with this little interlude, I claim I can write this, this annoying expression, it's growing in complexity as we speak, as r to the delta minus delta hat, sum on j equals zero to infinity, minus r squared j, j factorial two to the two j, delta hat plus three minus d over two j, Laplacian to the j over x to the two delta hat. Right, so I, I, I had here like uh, some two delta hat plus two j powers, which is what I wanna solve for. So I move this junk over to the left-hand side, it cancels some things here, and I'm left with this rather gnarly looking sum at the end of the day. And, and that's my C, that's my C delta, right? That's, uh, that's what I was after. This is, uh, this gives me C, what was I calling it? C delta hat of R and partial. So I draw a line under that. Next step. We're gonna construct the boundary block, G delta, boundary C1. So what is that? It's R1 delta one, R2 delta two, C delta hat, R1 partial one, C delta hat, R2 partial two, acting on that boundary two-point function. So we write it out, R1 R2 to the delta hat. Those leading factors of R should, should cancel out and I get to replace it with R1 and R2. Um, sum on J and K minus R1 squared to the J minus R2 squared to the K. J factorial, K factorial two So I hope this begins to give you some appreciation about why I wouldn't want to do this in the bulk case where I've got you know, two cross ratios and things are, and, and sums over you know, spins. Here it's just a sum over scalar blocks. Um, and it's sort of just at the limit of what I can deal with. That's part of why I thought I'd go through this. And even so, there's a step coming up uh, which requires a fairly obscure knowledge of, uh, of complicated sums. So we'll go ahead and we'll act with a Laplacian on this, this object and we'll use our result again here uh, to pull back um, everything in terms of uh, coefficients or Pockhammer symbols. So I have a sum on J and K minus R1 squared to the J minus R2 squared to the K, Pock hammer J plus K, Pock hammer three minus D over two J plus K, 
J factorial, K factorial, delta hat. Right. Oh, there's still one more piece here that I haven't written. So the last bit here is that is the dependence on these uh, the, the 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 distance between the points. So two delta hat plus two j plus two k. So things are looking rather fearsome. And and, and now the miracle occurs. <laughs> like that that I don't know if people still remember the far side cartoon by Gary Larson. There's a famous cartoon where someone's working some horrible mathematics and he says, now the miracle occurs. And, and like, this sum you can look up. Who knew? I found it in a nice paper by Dolan and Osborne where they're computing just this kind of conformal blocks. So it's a, it's a sum that's useful for computing conformal blocks. Uh, this thing reduces this is the miracle. If one of you knows how to derive this, I, I'd actually be kind of curious. I mean, there, there is a derivation in terms of this differential equation. I showed you this Casimir root to it. But I was wondering about a more uh, direct derivation of how to collapse this sum to a single sum, which is, which is the miracle. That, that you can write this in terms now of our cross ratio. I mean, the trouble with this Dolan and Osborne paper that I found is there's no reference for this sum. They just quote the result. Maybe if I read the paper more carefully, I'd see where they derived it, but it, it doesn't look like they derived it. And that you can almost recognize as a hypergeometric function. It's not quite in the right form. I should have two Pockhammer symbols up top, but in fact, I can split this up into two different Pockhammer symbols uh, by absorbing some of these factors of two. And this whole thing, you, you get to write it in the following slightly more compact way. And then finally, there's one last identity, which is a much better known identity. It's one of these quadratic identities for these hypergeometric functions. I think, for example, Mathematica knows about this, this relation that you can write this finally in the form we'll use it in, in the form you'll often find in the literature, two minus d plus two delta hat minus one over c1. So that's one of the simplest conformal blocks out there. And it, it gives you some sense of, of the labor involved to derive these things. But again, at this point, it, most of the time you just go and look it up, look, look them up. Are there questions? It took about 20 minutes, what I thought. Was it worth it? I see some people shaking their heads. I see some other people not. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe I need to reconsider whether to show, show this or not. I, I remember, was it Sidney Coleman? I, used to, I, I took some classes with Sidney Coleman. I'm not old. Um, I was at Harvard. I took his famous field theory course. And I remember he used to emphasize, you know, as a theoretical physicist, you should never let them see you sweat. And uh, you, you may have just seen me drop a bead of perspiration or two in der driving this, so I've, I, I violated one of his axioms.
So we're done with chapter five. We have all these conformal blocks under our belt and the time has come to do something with them and uh, think a little bit more carefully about what, what actually a conformal field theory is. And that brings us to chapter six and a discussion of the conformal bootstrap. This is an old notion, uh, I think probably most successfully employed in, in two-dimensional conformal field theory where you've got this full Virasor algebra and you get all kinds of great things from it like the minimal models. Uh, it was, it's much less powerful in this context, but there's been kind of a rebirth of it with numerical methods, um, people trying to apply it in a higher dimensional context. So I was proposing in the previous chapter or the previous hour, I was saying a definition of a CFT is a set of conformal primaries and their three-point function coefficients. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't quite work because most of the time, such a definition is, uh, is not consistent. And it's not consistent uh, with respect to the following constraint, which I think is maybe kind of obvious from what we were doing over here with these, these defect case, but let me, let me make it painfully clear in the bulk case. So what we did in the bulk, right, we, 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 we have this kind of picture for what we were doing. We were taking phi of x2 and phi of x1 and we were bringing them close together and expanding them in some sum of our primaries and their descendants and then contracting that with phi of x4 and phi of x3 and I'm trying to put them in the right place so that it uh, works well with my equations. But we didn't have to do that. We could have done the following instead. We could have taken phi of x1 and brought it close to phi of x4 and we could have taken phi of x2 and brought that close to phi of x3. And it, 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 we had the same analog in the boundary case, you know, where we were thinking about two-point functions. We could bring those two-point functions close together, or we could bring them, each of them separately close to the boundary. And no matter which decomposition we do, we'd better get the same answer, right? It's the same four-point function. So let's just recall these cross ratios. We had u, which was x12 squared, x34 squared, and 3 squared, x24 squared, and we had v, which was x14 squared, x23 squared, over x13 squared, x24 squared. So the same denominator. And what I'm basically doing here, uh, at the level of equations is I'm doing a two four swap on my four point function, which you can see at the level of these cross ratios is also performing a swap of those cross ratios u and v. So in one case, or in the first case, I had g, this function of two cross ratios over this kinematic factor x1, 2 to the 2 eta, x3, 4 to the 2 eta. And in the second case, better be equal, I've swapped u and v, I've also swapped 2 and 4, so I've got 1, 4 to the 2 eta and 2, 3 to the 2 eta uh, downstairs. Or I can you know, bring these uh, denominators to either side and express everything in terms of cross ratios. I have the following invariant statement purely in terms of u and v that v to the eta times g of u of v is the same as u to the eta times g of v and u.
this looks a little bit awkward. If you're just going to tell me a general spectrum instead of three-point functions, well, why am I saying that's awkward? Well, let's go ahead and decompose it. So I'm going to sum over my spectrum, weighted by the three-point function coefficients, and these conformal blocks, which are all, in principle, known functions. And I'm saying this is the same as the sum on the swap. Right? And it seems very unlikely that some generic choice of three-point functions and uh, spectrum is going to be consistent with a relation like that. In fact, let's try to, let's try to cast it in a slightly more constraining-looking form to make that even a little bit more apparent. So let's go ahead and let's remove, remove the identity operator from the sum, in which case I can write this as v to the eta 1 plus the sum of the identity operator removed. And that had better be the same as the, the swapped guy. Or let's you know, go ahead and bring everything to one side. So I've got a sum over my spectrum. I know I always have an identity operator, it better. And then I've got this crazy looking thing which is completely fixed, by the way, by the kinematics. And it better be true that that whole thing is one. And again, you know, you give me your favorite choice of uh, operator spectrum, favorite choice of three-point functions, seems very unlikely that if I sum over this fixed object, let's give it a name, f delta i of u and v, seems very unlikely I'll get one. So my, my definition of my CFT will be inconsistent. So you say, okay, fine. I won't tell you everything. I'll just tell you, I don't know, I'll tell you the spectrum. So you tell me the spectrum. So I have the delta i, that's a given. And we'll just adjust the c delta i squareds uh, for consistency. How about that? That looks like it might work. Totally free to adjust the C delta i's how I like. But here's the uh, surprising thing. And in fact, in fact, we can bound, we can bound the spectrum. By using this crossing symmetry constraint. And now it's, it needs a little bit more input. It needs, it needs a little bit more input. You need, you need an additional assumption for this to work, at least in the way it's usually formulated, although I think there's a lot of interest these days in trying to push beyond this. Um, and the assumption is following. You need an assumption of unitarity, which in the Euclidean setting is often phrased equivalently in terms of reflection positivity. And that's gonna, for example, tell us that these C delta i's are real and so that these coefficients are greater than or equal to zero. And so, you know, if you choose your spectrum wrong, uh, you may find yourself in a situation where like, I don't know, the left-hand side 
effectively has to be negative and you can never get something positive on the right-hand side, which allows you to rule out whole swaths of uh, possible spectra for CFT. Now, there's a natural question you can ask at this point. I'll put this on hold for a minute. We're going to come back to this and talk about this at length, probably not completely today, but I have a whole several pages in my notes devoted to what uh, these constraints mean. We'll begin a discussion in a few minutes, but, but for the moment, let's just put that on the back burner and ask a related question. Or I could even let you, well, let me ask it, and then I'll let you, let you ask other questions that you're interested in. And so, so the question I want to ask is, do higher point functions give further constraints? This is all phrased in the language of four-point functions. And the answer is no. And the way to see this is you just impose crossing symmetry on, on, on intermediate channels in the higher point functions. And I, again, I'm not going to write, write this out in equations, but I, I think a picture may be enough to convince you about what's going on. So for example, if we took a, fi a five point function that we had before, this is one possible decomposition of the five-point function. And crossing symmetry, we can think about crossing symmetry just acting on that channel, in which case this should be equivalent to a decomposition in the following way. And the claim is that by imposing these crossing symmetry on intermediate channels, the four-point function crossing symmetry constraint on intermediate channels, you can access all possible crossing symmetry constraints for the higher point functions. So there's no further constraint here that you get by looking at, at higher point functions. And, and I'll just say that you know, more formally what we're saying is uh, more formally this is, a, this is a statement about associativity. Of the operator algebra. You know, if we have these three operators, it doesn't matter whether we first bring those close together or the second two close together. By associativity of the algebra, that should give the same answer inside the, the, the amplitude. Great. So that's the introduction to the bootstrap. So the next topic I want to cover, and I think I can say a little bit about it, and then we'll get into the technical details uh, tomorrow morning. Um, but are there questions before I go on? Oh, why do we need to consider four-point functions? The three-point functions are kind of trivial somehow, right? I mean, we, we saw already that they're just fixed up to numbers. Um, and we didn't, we didn't have to worry about associativity at all. Maybe, huh, you're saying maybe I could somehow just from that see that the algebra has to be associative? I guess so, yeah. I think that's probably right. Although the real sort of serious consequence of that you don't see really until you impose this crossing constraint on four-point functions. Interesting. Okay. So we, we use for four-point functions that's more convenient. I, I, I guess from, just from a technical point of view, I don't know how to extract useful information from looking at the three-point function. But logically, the constraints are already in the three-point function. I, I, that sounds right. From at least what I'm writing on the board right there, yeah, it looks like the constraints are already there in a sense at the, at the level of the, the three-point function. Yeah. When you set up the operators, why do you have to remove the identity operators and not take the original oh. sign? Yeah. Yeah, 
that, you can. I, I, I'm doing that because um, after I do this interlude on unitarity and reflection positivity, I'll tell you how people usually set up the numerical bootstrap. And one way they do is they often separate out the identity operator um, as a special operator. And I think in this form, it also makes it a little bit clearer uh, that you'll run into trouble, you know, with your general selection of spectrum and, and three-point functions. Oh, in the back, yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not so familiar with this vertex algebra presentation of it, so. Other questions? Yeah, can you have a continuum spectrum of primaries? I, th I think in general, yes. And I th often in this bootstrap approach, people are assuming there's a discrete spectrum. Why? Why do they assume that? Because it's easy. <laughs> I don't know. I think I heard you ask this question to Nikolai Bobev last week. Yeah, I mean, in the icing model, for instance, it seems like a useful point of view to take that you have a discrete spectrum and you seem to get reasonable data from that assumption. I know that, anyway, like the, the, the Leoville theory has a continuous spectrum in 2D and it's an interesting CFT and I think indeed it might be rather hard to run a bootstrap program when you have continuous spectrum. Already you wind up having, from a numerical point of view, to truncate the spectrum to some finite selection of fields, so. I, I don't know. It's it's a good question. Sorry, I'm sorry. Up until that point, you, you do not assume unitarity and you can apply this to non-unitarity. I should have crossing symmetry in general, yeah. But now to get a little bit of more mileage, I want to further assume this. And I'll tell you in my last five minutes some of the, what, what that means a little bit more de detail. And we'll come back to the bootstrap tomorrow. And again, by unitarity, really this is reflection positivity. So, so the constraints are the following. And we'll explain again, probably tomorrow, since I'm running out of time now, where these constraints come from. So first constraint is that C delta I squared is greater than zero. So the C delta I's, the three-point function coefficients are real. We'll show, show you how, how that comes about. And then I have the following bounds on, on the spectra. That for something in a symmetric traceless representation of Lorentz, so L equals one, two, three, so forth. So this could be some vector, some two tensor, symmetric two tensor, et cetera, et cetera. The bounds are the following. For a fermion, the bound is d minus one over two. So like for a neutrino, some massless fermionic particle. And then for a scalar, the bound is d minus two over two.
and I'll show you where those bounds come from next time. But before we get to that, let me make some remarks about the data, this interesting data. I hope you already see why it's interesting. So L equals zero, I saturate the bound when D, delta is D minus two over two. What's significant about that number? So, say it. The, the free field dimension, right? This is the dimension of a free field, free scalar. For L equals a half, I've got it saturated when it's D minus one over two. And what, what again is special about that? It's the free fermion, right? Three halves in four dimensions. How about L equals one? If delta is D minus one, what's special about that? It's a conserved current. It's a charge per unit de density, spatial density, right? So the charge is dimensionless, but density, spatial density has mass dimension D minus one. L equals two. What's special about that? It's a stress tensor. We have a ringer in the audience. She knows all the answers. It's good. Well, let's leave that there. Let's move to the other side. So what's special about all of these, these objects? What's special about all of these objects? The free scalar, the free fermion, the conserved current, the stress tensor. What do they have in common? Go ahead, say that. What? They saturate the bounds, absolutely, but there's something else they have in common. They're protected. Well, the free fermion and free scale are not really, but conserve currents and stress tensors, yeah. Something else. I don't know what I'm after. They satisfy some equation, absolutely. They satisfy some equation. The free scalar satisfies delta phi equals zero. The free fermion satisfies the Dirac equation. The conserved current satisfies d mu j mu equals zero. And the conserved stress tensor also satisfies a conservation condition. So in the language of conformal field theory, what am I saying when I say that? What is a derivative? It's a descendant. So I'm saying there's a null state, right? There's, some, there's a shortening condition on all of these primaries. Or so there's a shortening condition on all these multiplets. That there's some descendants in all of these cases which should be there, but they're not. And that I think is rather intimately related to the fact that in all these cases I'm saturating a unitarity bound. Oh, and I have, yeah, I have one more minute. So let's argue for the three point functions being positive. So by unitarity, I really mean reflection. positivity. So I, I have a few minutes. Let me explain where that C delta I squared greater than zero comes from. And then next time I'll show you where these other inequalities come from. So reflection positivity means the following. I have a, some kind of reflection operation which I can act on a string of operators, uh, which is going to, if I have some plane in my space time and I have a bunch of operators, it's going to produce those same operators, reflected version of those operators on the opposite side of the plane. And the claim of reflection positivity, it's one of these Weitman axioms for a good, good quantum field theory, is that that quantity should be, zero, should be greater or equal to zero, okay? So in the case of um, the C delta I is, the C delta I there, what I want to do is I want to think about taking these points way, way off to the right 
in which case these other three points go way, way off to the left. So I'm thinking about a six-point function here. And by cluster decomposition, this should be approximately equal to the reflected version of some three-point function multiplied by the original version of the three-point function. And the reflected version and the original version, they're both, they have the same kinematics. They're both controlled by the same three-point function coefficient. So in order for this thing to be, non, to be greater than or equal to zero, it had better be true that those, those three-point function coefficients are real. You see how this works? Like each of these, each of these looks like our favorite C, what is it, one, two, three over some products, X one, two to something x2, 3 to something, x3, uh, 1 to some power. And this also, so everything here is, is positive, except possibly for the coefficient. And so in order for this to work, that those coefficients had better be real. So that guarantees reflection positivity and this, this principle of cluster decomposition. Pull these, these, three, these three points, these clusters of three points really far from the reflection plane that guarantees that first condition that the three-point function coefficients are real and their squares are positive. Okay. I'm a little bit over time. We'll regroup tomorrow and we'll continue and explain where these bounds come from.